I'm Sarah Barth, Executive Director of Semper Virens Fund. Thank you for joining us for another of our Under the Redwoods webinar series in which we explore the beauty, history, science, benefits, inspiration, art, you name it, anything related to redwood forests. Um, as we always do, we start with an acknowledgement of the fact that the redwood forests in the Santa Cruz Mountains, where we do our conservation work, are among the ancestral lands for many different indigenous groups, uh, people who cared for the land for millennia until they were forcibly removed. We are grateful to work with their descendants, um, including the Amamutsan Tribal Band and the Mawekma Ohlone, to restore their cultural and traditional relationships to these amazing forests. We also want to thank uh, Sharf Investments for sponsoring this webinar series. They've been um, great in offering their support for this um, program. Many of you have been with us before on these webinars. If you have, you know that we are recording. Um, if you miss some of the uh, recording, you can watch it later. It'll be up on our website. Um, and if you have questions that you'd like to ask of our speaker, please put it in the Q&A or the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. We have a really great speaker today. Before we get into, before I introduce her, let me just take a moment to update you on some things happening here at Semper Virens Fund. It has been another um, unusual season for us. Instead of fire this time, the landscape within which we work has been dealing with unbelievable amounts of precipitation, um, ranging from atmospheric rivers uh, dumping inches of rain to most recently winter storms bringing snow to our region. And it's just a good reminder that nature is extremely dynamic and that our climate is changing and we're seeing that manifest directly in the landscape in which we work. Despite that, um, and we'll have some interesting things to talk to you all about as we learn more about what this change in precipitation means for the landscape. But uh, for now, what I wanna share with you is um, several things. One is uh, Big Basin State Park is getting ready to undergo the next phase of their planning process for reopening the park. We'll be very involved with that and keep you abreast of it. Um, we are especially excited and want to give a shout out to our new assembly member from the Santa Cruz region, Gail Pellerin, who just introduced legislation uh, at the request of Semper Virens to help uh, prioritize land acquisition that will uh, allow for acquisition of properties that can be added to Big Basin State Park as part of their reopening process. So that's really exciting and unusual, and we'll keep you abreast of both the developments and how you can help, um, because we'll need some support from you in advocating to get the legislature to pass that legislation. As a result of these efforts and a variety of reasons, we are in the midst of um, purchasing or in uh, exploring the purchase of a number of conservation properties. We just closed, meaning we just purchased a small property that's directly adjacent to Big Basin, um, and we're in the midst of discussions uh, around many others. So lots of exciting things happening, um, and we will be happy to keep you abreast of all that. One of the things that we're seeing already as a result of all this precipitation is an explosion in fungi in the region. And so it's especially great that we have here today our guest, Dr. Patricia Onaniwu Kashian. And she um, is a mycologist. She is a visiting associate professor at Bard College in New York. She specializes in research, exploration of new species of fungi and understanding how they can be indicators of ecosystem health. But she also really goes well beyond mycology in her interesting analyses of um, how science and conservation are situated in the larger socio-political context. And if you read her articles that she wrote for Semper Virens, you'll get a sense of that. And I'm sure she'll talk about it today um, and some of the parallels between the conservation movement and the eugenics movement. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, with that, I'm going to welcome Patty and invite her to start her talk. I'll go off screen. And again, to our audience, if you have questions, please submit them in the chat and the Q&A function, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. But welcome, Patty. Thanks, Sarah. 
Um, thanks for having me uh, here for the Sever Veterans Fund. I'm really happy to share my um, time with you today. And um, I'm thankful for everyone who came and is here to learn. Um, and I hope to share some interesting stuff with you all. So let me go ahead and share my screen and start my presentation. Um, last time it took a moment to load. So could I maybe get a thumbs up if you could see it? From the, maybe Sarah or... Can you see it yet? All right, let me do this. This happened last time. Let me just do it one more time. How about now? Okay, great. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk to you about um, a number of things mycology, the redwood forest that are probably very near and dear to many of you, and also a sort of darker chapter, an element of scientific history, which is the eugenics movement. And perhaps you've read the articles I put out with Stan Perverans ahead of this. And, um, and if you have, then you'll have a sort of a sense of where this is going. But if you haven't read those articles, um, no worries. I'm going to sort of walk you through a number of the elements that are woven throughout those pieces. And I want to, I want to say that this is a really layered, complex, and nuanced topic that I do not, um, you know, we can't cover in its entirety in uh, this hour that we have together. So my intention here is really just to share some of these elements and begin a conversation, sort of spore the conversation, if you will, and hopefully it'll pique your interest and your curiosity and you can continue to read and learn about these things beyond um, this conversation today. So I want to start with talking a little bit about mycology, which um, well, let me let me actually sorry frame the conversation a little bit more specifically. So, I want to put forth a few assertions, um, starting with that our lack of knowledge about mycology, which I'll get into in a moment, is not coincidental with the climate crisis that we find ourselves in today. And additionally, the climate crisis is not a purely geophysical problem. So in other words, it's not just about how much carbon is in the atmosphere or you know, you know, the fact that we have to stop burning fossil fuels, although those things are of course relevant and important to talk about. But the climate crisis is in, in fact a crisis that is deeply woven with our social histories. And to truly understand the scope of the problem that we're dealing with today, we do need to invoke a detailed knowledge of these social histories and understand how they've materially impacted the earth um, and how they materially impact the production of knowledge in science. So while some of these elements and these ideas will kind of float into the abstract, I hope to make it clear today in this talk that these things are not just intellectual academic ideas, but they're actually very material. And I, and, and I wanna sort of explore the materiality of these concepts and that's sort of where I hope we can go today. So I wanna put these two questions forward for you that you will maybe keep in your mind throughout the talk. And I wanna circle back to them at the end um, and the first question is, what would it mean for a society if their accumulated wealth was due to the, not due to their inherent greatness, but due to the forced labor of others? And similarly, what it, would it mean to sort of the symbology of a redwood or the, and the, the sort of grandness of the redwood forests if we were to understand that they were not sustained by sort of the inherent individualized genetic excellence of a redwood tree, but actually crucially supported by an underground network of fungi. So I know I haven't unpacked a lot of these elements, but I want you just sort of to hold these two questions in your, in your mind as, as we proceed. So starting with mycology, um, what do we know about mycology? So we know that fungi perform numerous functions all around the world. Basically in every conceivable niche on the planet, you have a fungi doing various things. So we're talking from hydrothermal vents in the, in the ocean to desert air, to the soils of redwood forests. Fungi are, are everywhere all of the time. And they're doing essential things like providing nourishment directly as a food source to animals, including us, of course. They offer habitat to invertebrate species um, and other small creatures. 
And they support new life through interfacing with death and decomposition. They, they release nutrients into the, the landscape. They break down lignin and cellulose and pl from plant matter, and they also decompose animal remains. So in many ways, they're these ecosystem engineers. They also perform a spectrum of symbiotic interactions. So symbiosis is this is sort of a way of referring to species, different species that live in direct in encounter with one another. And this can range from parasitism to mutualism, um, all of which are critical to biodiversity habitats around the world. So some examples of this symbiosis are that fungi form um, evolve, some have evolved to live in the guts of termites and they can digest cellulose. The, fun, the fungus can digest the cellulose, which enables the termite to eat and digest the wood. And then perhaps you've heard of the um, relationships fungi form with plants, which are called mycorrhizae or mycorrhizal relationships. And so, over 90% of terrestrial plants some form some sort of fungal partnership with plants. And typically this involves the fungus providing essential nutrients to the plant, usually in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus, and also providing water and other sometimes microbial protections against um, pathogens. And the plant in exchange is providing sugar in the form of carbon to the fungus because the fungus can't photosynthesize. It's a heterotroph, it needs to eat. So it needs to you know, seek its nutrients um, by through digestion or through the partnership with the plant, which can photosynthesize and render uh, sugar from the sun. So these um, all types of relationships are, these are just two of, of innumerable types of symbioses that fungi engage in around the world. And one of the famous mushrooms you've probably seen in person maybe, or at least its iconography, is the fly agaric mushroom or Amanita muscaria, which um, is something that grows in the Pacific Northwest and also throughout uh, sort of the temperate boreal region of um, around Europe and um, West Asia. I I in New, I'm in New York, by the way, and we have a variety of this, the our Amanita muscaria um, gasawii, which is yellow, so we don't have the red one, but we know that there are just an incredible amount of fungal species. So at present, there's a the scientific consensus is that there's about 3 million species of fungi on the planet. But actually, just at the end of last year, 2022, um, a new study offered an, a higher estimate, which was something closer to 10 million species that might exist or on Earth. But so while we're still even there, basically the number is so high that we're not even sure how many exist, but we do know that it's in, in the millions. And of, of those millions, we've only described 150,000 species formally to science. So uh, that's, you know, less than 10% of what is out there. So over 90% of the fungi on Earth um, are yet to be described. The photo on the right is, or my right anyway, is um, a group of fungi that I do a lot of research on called the Labulbinielles, which are parasites on insects. So these are the long sort of filiform um, bodies you see are, are cluster, a cluster of these fungi growing on the claw of a beetle that swims in uh, the water. So these are collected in Florida. Um, so, which speaking of which, we a lot most of the fungal diversity that we've yet to uh, encounter formally is, are on underexamined microhabitats like the bodies of insects or even our own bodies. Um, also, caves and deep sea vents and sort of habitats that just haven't received a lot of attention. But also in biodiversity hotspots like rain tropical rainforests. So there's so much we have to do um, in order to understand even just what exists. Um, I included here a screenshot of um, from iNaturalist. Maybe some of you have used this resource before. It's an app, or you can use it as a website to look at and report biodiversity encounters around the world. Um, and it's really a lot of people in, the, in North America use the app to report their findings from mushrooms to birds to insects. Um, and there's actually hundreds of documented species of macro fungi, so fungi that are visible with the naked eye in California. Um, and I, I recommend a really beautiful book by Christian Schwartz and Noah Siegel called Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. And maybe that can be dropped in the chat. Um, it's a gorgeous book um, by authors who did a lot of work in this re in your region. Um, and they do have it in that book, they 
include a treatment of over 700 species of, of fungi that live in and around redwood forests. It's really beautiful and I recommend it. Um, and these species include the bright, some, some like sort of charismatic, bright and conspicuous soil dwelling fungi such as Leptonia carnia, which I'll, I'll show you a photo of in a moment, and also some like wood decay fungi um, that are a little bit over, easily overlooked even for fungi like annulo hypoxylon. So this is uh, Leptonia carnia by the photograph by Christian Schwartz. It's a beautiful purple mushroom and you can find this growing um, in and around the Redwood Coast area. Um, and here's a screenshot of also from iNaturalist of just various common mushrooms that grow in the Redwood Coast area. So we'll, I think in the discussion, we'll circle back to a conversation around iNaturalist and ways you can get involved with reporting fungal biodiversity and just sort of experiencing it and doing so in a way that's helpful to scientists. Um, and this, these are illustrations by Rebecca Zwanig from um, one of the pieces I wrote on, on fun, about the fungi of the redwoods. So these are, these are some of the species that you can see um, around us. What we don't know about mycology. So there are millions of undescribed species, as I was saying. Um, we, we know a lot about some of them, but knowing a species, like recording it and describing it formally is just the first step in really knowing what, what it is and what's going on. So when you find a new species, you know, you give it a name, you may report maybe it's basic morphology, where you found it, maybe you get a DNA sequence from it, but you don't necessarily know much more. So we've described 150,000 species, but of those many, we don't have, we have just the like most cursory knowledge about. So we are still learning about their ecology. So how they're interacting with other organisms, what their life cycles are like, what their biochemistry is like, their ge geography and all of these things. Um, so we've just started to scratch the surface about this. Um, so we're really, we're barely, barely even understand how fungi operate in our own bodies because um, we have like a ton of fungi that are in our cells and on our, or in, sorry, within our tissues. Um, and there's so many fungal cells in our body, but we still don't even really know how they're operating within us, never mind much more remote and sort of distant habitats. Um, and even the more famous uh, ecological systems that involve fungi, such as the mycorrhizal networks, are still sort of being debated in terms of how they actually function and to like how and what can we really understand? What, what do we actually know about them and how much is just sort of needs more evidence or just needs to be pursued with more research? So I kind of think we basically know nothing about fungi, although I will say that we definitely know enough to understand that the earth depends on this kingdom really intricately and in many ways, innumerable ways. And we and I do we do know enough to say that we absolutely need more mycological research and more attention paid towards this really, really fascinating group of life. So this is where it gets a little tricky and I'm gonna do my best to sort of um, you know, briefly, given the time constraints, introduce some concepts that weave in together. So why don't we know about mycology? And, you know, there are some, some answers that are more obvious, like, okay, they're, some of them are invisible, um, they need, you know, particular tools to study them, and that's true, but that's true of other things that we also know a lot about, um, like a lot of, you know, medical research happens on the micro scale. Um, but why, why don't we know about mycology? And this is something that has long fascinated me. And I think it's the fact that mycology is so understudied and under-researched and underfunded is part of what drew me in. Um, and I wanna, wanna introduce, I wanna pose this analogy for you. So science and the methodology used by science is a cookie cutter. And in this analogy, the, the dough is the universe and all that can be learned about the universe. And the cookie cutter is you know, constructed by people. Scientists are human beings who live in a, a society and who are shaped by the world that they, are, that they live in, um, both physically and culturally, socially. And when you construct the cookie cutter and you, you're trying to you know, cleave off parts of the dough. Um, so in, you're trying to ask questions about the universe and cleave off like sort of bite-sized pieces so that you can you know, piecemeal together an understanding of the world around us. When you cleave the dough and press the cutter into the dough, the shape that's rendered tells you not so much about the shape of the dough, but actually about the shape of the cutter. And the cutter is constructed by human beings 
who have with them a cultural um, sort of lens. And they, what the way in which the cookie cutter was shaped and its angles and its size and all of these things are telling you about the person who asked this question or the person who made the cutter. And the dough, the universe, is in fact incredibly messy and sprawling and, and interconnected and impossible to fully understand. Um, so when you take these small components, you're taking, you know, what you can manage to understand in your social cultural reality. And I think scientists um, are, are, you know, we're trained to pursue objectivity and that is a noble pursuit, but it is ultimately unattainable. And it's important to reflect on the ways in which science has um, shaped ma our material knowledge of biology and how culture has in turn sort of entered the conversation through sort of the human element of science. So mycology is a really powerful case study in the material ways by which science and culture reinforce each other. And when you when we go back in time into the history of science, we can we find lots of evidence that your sort of European culture and Ameri and Euro-American culture were disinterested in these these groups, this group of organisms. Um, they were sort of collectively uh, fungi were collectively viewed as being harmful or disgusting or poisonous or pathogenic and just sort of not important and. If they were important, it was only because they were destroying something that was valuable to us, like a crop. But to be studied in their own right was something that was not emphasized in the sort of the time period where science was becoming institutionalized in Western Europe. Now, of course, people all over the world conducted science in their own ways and in their own right, but where but the fact that science became institutionalized in Western Europe was um that has then made a disproportionate influence on the practice of science around the world because the it, it contained in the institutions the values of the people that were kept in the institutions. And others were systematically excluded. Women, people of color, and people of lower class were not invited to participate in formal science. And so actually mushrooms and fungi were then relegated to the domain of like women um, at this time. So fungi were not included in formal academic studies by most people. And in fact, they were kind of given to women to study who women who were systematically barred from formal participation in science could take on this sort of um, leisurely sort of gentle uh, recreational consideration of fungi. And the reason for this partly, I mean, again, this is an area that I can't get into nearly as much as I would like to, but fungi are sort of disruptive to very key cultural elements of Western philosophy. Um, Western philosophy emphasizes individualism, predictability, and control through dominance. And fungi in their unpredictability, in their uncontrollability, and in their sort of sort of more fluid ways of being um, were perceived as antagonistic. And the priority then, therefore, was not to understand them, but to eradicate them. And they were also labeled as lower plants by Linnaeus, Carl Linnaeus, the father of uh, the taxonomy and gave us the binomial nomenclature system. Um, and this status of lower plant meant they were lower prestige. So the study of them could be then given to lower class people like women and people of color. So, okay, we're swirling in lots of things right now, but let me sort of direct your attention to, so as institutionalization of science was occurring, there are other pro projects of Western Europe also um, sort of developing. So the project of American settler colonialism in which, um, the United States and other, or the North American other places were colonized and settled um, and sort of expanded. This was, this is a project that began, of course, hundreds of years ago, and Western expansion has started to sort of peak around the same time as the institutional science and the study of naturalism was also um, developing. So the frontier, of course, was settled and the indigenous peoples that were native to this area were um, the victims of one of the largest genocidal campaigns in recorded history. Um, and the displacement led to, of course, then Im immense resource uh, extraction through um, the felling of trees and the clearing of uh, landscapes for um, economic growth. Um, and this is sort of where the social and biological histories become very entangled. 
the, the biological and social history here actually are imprinting the earth. There's a physical global result of this sort of philosophical pr process and um, procedure. So the capital production we see, we, for, for capital production, we see the raising of forests, decimation of grasslands, and the creation of, the pl of plantations through and the form the plantations were formed so that we could create large scale monocultures that were first and foremost for profit. Um, and of course, this was supplied through um, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and the only real value system at play here was was profit. Um, so this is this is something that massively reshaped the earth physically. So around the world, we see this is not just in North America, but where there is colonialism, there is biodiversity loss. The biodiversity loss is caused by the habitat destruction, you know, and so by various means, whether it's logging, whether it's conversion of grasslands into agriculture, et cetera. But also really critically, this biodiversity loss is the result of the eradications of the peoples in those regions who dutifully cared for the species that were, in essence, their companion species, the, eco the ecological niche that gave rise to various groups of people around the world. And when they were removed or killed, um, they the species that they cared for, that they promoted the biodiversity of, also suffered. And this is a, a massive consequence all over the world. Again, this is we're kind of focused on North America, but this phenomenon is 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 global. So also around this time, as sort of there was this ramping up of westward expansion and the logging of what uh, redwoods, um, eugenics was also sort of I almost said blossoming, but it was more like it's blossoming would not be the word, sort of wretchedly expanding. <laughs> Um, and it was a popular widespread movement. I think a lot of people think that eugenics is some sort of like back alley, like under your breath kind of like secret society thing that only like you, you know, you don't publicize. Um, and while it certainly has somewhat gone underground today, it was a really popular widespread movement. It was taught in universities and colleges all throughout the country and around Europe. Um, for over 100 years. It was not, you know, a blip on the radar. It was a very, in, like, large part of scientific education and social thought. Um, and eugenicists aimed to sort of sort the world using both scientific and, and of course, a lot of pseudoscientific means um, to sort of divide races and to sort humans between what, you know, who they saw as the best you know, the fittest, the best, the smartest, and the and into like the least evolved and maladapted groups. Um, and there was the argument that the gene pool, the human gene pool, if it was kept pure, um, pure in in you know by their definition, um, could lead to a stronger, more powerful race of of people. And you would have, but in order to do that, you would have to selectively breed and um, exclude other you know, le considered lesser people from that gene pool. Um, and there are three linked principles here, um, that humans are exceptional to nature in all respects and sort of the pinnacle of evolution. Um, and the white race in particular was exceptional and that a thriving society is achieved and maintained by oppression of both inferior races and groups of people and of nature. And importantly, nature is really not, it's not, it's a very essential part of the eugenics view. So not only are humans um, internally segregated, um, but humans are apart from nature. We're not seen as of having been, you know, these messy sort of entanglements with nature. We are something set apart. Um, even if you have a biological understanding of, of our evolution that's in context with other beings, there's the eugenicist will still assert that there's something just sort of just inherently special about people. Um, so this it, so this is the expansion of that philosophy to the broader natural world. This is where we get the idea, the creation of wilderness as a concept, as something that's pure and unadulterated. Um, and what's biggest and oldest and most charismatic, like like um, you know our beautiful redwood trees, are considered the best and therefore the most evolved. So there were some very prominent eugenicists who were very knowledgeable about science and active in conservation. So Theodore Roosevelt, Madison Grant, Charles M. Goethe, 
These people organ were active, proud eugenicists who also advocated for the protection of redwood forests and laid for the foundation of a mainstream conservation movement in the U.S. Um, so they're, they're sort of, the, the, red, the redwood forests in particular were selected as a symbol of the conserva of this eugenics movement because they saw redwoods as being absolutely spectacular and they argued singular in its exceptional status. So the, the fact that they were the biggest and the best was something that they thought would well represent the white race. And that is what galvanized the the um, sort of resistance to the clearing of redwoods was, was very substantially motivated by the linking of that symbology. And of course, it's deeply ironic because, of course, what was leading to the destruction of the redwoods was settler colonialism and the destruction of the relationships between indigenous people in this area and their land. Um, and it's, you know, so it, it but it, so the irony is that they asserted that it was actually, the symbol was would well represent um, if we could protect the redwoods, this would be a wonderful representation of what it would like be like to protect the white race. Um, so it's obviously uh, deranged and and violent, um, but nonetheless, again, really widespread and popular. So um, I want to come back to those two questions that I posed at the beginning. So what would it mean for a society if their accumulated wealth was not due to the inherent greatness, but due to the forced labor of others? And similarly, what would it mean to redwood symbology if a redwood tree was not simply sustained by its raw genetic excellence, but was critically supported by an underground network of fungi? And here I'm asserting that the logic here is the same. The logic may not, you know, there's these are questions that can play out differently, but the the underpin the logic underpinning these two questions is the same. And it's this idea that is deeply entrenched in Western philosophy, which is that the individual is reified and first of all that an individual even is a sensible construct um, biologically which I would argue um, it's not right um, and I think well let me let me hang on to that for a second so I well let me go here first sorry <laughs> Um, what I want to say here is that climate, the climate crisis necessitates a radical reimagining of our relationship to land, and this can only be achieved through a historically and socially informed education. Science is important; it's a tool in this struggle. But it, we could, we could, you know, quantify all of the biodiversity loss. Um, we could talk about how what how much combustion of, of fossil fuels um, is permissible before we hit some sort of temperature threshold. Um, and all of that matters, it's part of it. But if we do not radically transform our relationship to land, we will fail at this, at, at sort of addressing this crisis. Um, and what we need is a new conservation movement, one that is intersectional, anti-capitalist, and impure. And I say impure because purity is sort of the um, sort of the lifeblood of the of the eugenicist movement. And we need to, in all ways, sort of like reject and purge that logic from our practices, from our science, and from how it really crucially how we relate to nature. So this is not, uh, you know, your grandpa's back to the land movement. What I want is, you know, what I'm advocating for is land back and also how to become a person who recognizes their deep interdependency, not only with other human beings, but with the, with the um, bio, biodiversity around us. So what the connection back to mycology is that there are so many lessons of how to construct this sort of radicalized movement that we can learn from the biology of mushrooms. And also, you know, we need to be stewards. So there's this sort of metaphor there, but then there's also the material reality of needing to protect fungi and protect organisms that were historically um, marginalized and neglected from science because they were not seen as valuable. Um, so, you know, I want to advocate for these less charismatic species and habitats, and this can help us recalibrate um, the values of our society. And I like to think about this idea of myceliating the conservation movement and myceliating this legacy of eugenics, where we de we don't just bury it and forget about it. We have to kind of work with it and break it down and understand how it got here, how it, what it's doing in our world, and look for the ways it's still active today, because the eugenics movement is, sadly, it's not dead. It's not just something in the past. It's something that affects us all in a direct way, but also it's 
it, there's a resurgence of it in, intellectually. So it's really important that we grapple with it very directly and understand its impact on us. And from there, I think it would be, I know I went a little longer than I hoped, but I would love to then just sort of segue from here into um, the conversation part of this piece so we can re like revisit um, a lot of these elements. And again, knowing that I didn't give it a full treatment at all, but just starting the, the conversation. Thank you, Patty. Um, and I think if you can um, stop share, you go. yeah, okay. and we can see more of you. Um, and as I said to you when we were preparing for this, there are so many different ways we could go with this conversation because yeah. we've on myriad massive themes. Um, but I want to, before we get into some of the eugenics and the future of the conservation movement, you know, just little topics like just that. Tiny things, yeah. I do want to spend a few minutes talking about fungus because. I will tell you, um, I have worked in conservation for a long time. I certainly understand the concept of the web of life and, you know, it's a tapestry. And if you pull out one thread, it weakens the tapestry. Like I've gotten that my whole mm -hmm. career. Uh, and yet, and I, I still um, think that in listening to you and reading your work that I realized how inherently biased I am against fungus, you know? It's not that I was unaware of the role that it plays in the ecosystem, but I don't think until recently I started thinking about it as essential to conservation. Of course it is, it's mm -hmm. just more hidden. It's, as you said, it's not well understood, it's not studied. Um, and there are all these cultural perceptions that we have of it that I should know better, but are just deeply ingrained in our society. Absolutely. And so, uh, I mean, it goes to my child, who is a child of conservationists, and will marvel at um, redwood trees and banana slugs. You know, he's not a squeamish kid, nothing like mm -hmm. that, loves all of nature. But if he sees a mushroom, he's going to kick it over. He's not going to think of it as something to be preserved. So mm -hmm. it just goes to show how deep this is, as you were alluding to. And given that, I guess the question I want to start with is, okay, what does it mean to conserve fungus? Uh, I started my career working on federal legislation involving endangered species protection. What would it look like if fungus were protected under the Endangered Species Act? And um, what would an organization like Sempervirens need to do differently to be more responsible as a conservator of fungus? Sure. Now that my eyes have been opened about yeah, how yeah, fungus sure. we've been, and that, that, of course, it's a mistake. Of course, we can't live without it. Right, of course. So I think that um, there's a lot there's a lot of ways that we need to address the la the sort of disparity of, um, of you know how fungi are regarded and in in, in um, scientifically and in, in conservation sectors. So um, you know usually there there's just when people conduct biodiversity inventory um, in order to assess you know land use impact, um, fungi are just typically not included at all. Right. So just starting to to include them in your biodiversity surveying um, is is something that is essential. Also, there's some really important organizations right now that are doing some cool work. So there's Fundacion Fungi, which is um, a group based in Chile, and they um, one of the founder of that is Juliana Fursi, who's been working in mycology for a few decades now, and she actually introduced um, legislation in uh, she's been from she's a I think a citizen of Chile, and she introduced legislation there to um, in explicitly include fungi in language um, in like the le legislature for conservation of fungi. So they, um, she and others work towards actually getting the word funga as an official word. So there's, we have flora, fauna, and funga now. Yeah. Um, so being very explicit that they also need to be protected, um, not just trees, not just birds, um, but these fungi need to be protected as well. Um, so there's this can happen, I think, at the local level, um, you know, just sort of at the municipality level, you can work toward work with um, groups that can that have power in sort of influencing what how do we you know assess for conservation and who's doing those assessments. Um, and just sort of include making sure that mycologists are like hired to consult with you or to be involved in those assessments as well. What's really tricky is that because we know so little about fungi, we don't have like baseline data, right? So, you know, we, we I mean, and we don't have a ton of baseline data. There's, 
insufficient data for all groups, I would say, because we, we've so much of our research has happened after colonialism, which already led to so much biodiversity loss. But we do know, we know more about some groups than we do fungi. So unfortunately, you know, we're trying to describe species and get data on them. And they're, they're kind of like going extinct faster than we can assess them. Um, and that's a, definitely a point of stress. So I think in general, just like having um, people there. So actually, let me mention the other group that um, I want to sort of plug, which is um, the, what is it? Oh, my goodness. Uh, North American... Uh, mycoflora project is one um, and then oh, the fungal diversity survey in North America is another group that actually people here if they were interested could get directly involved in they're deploying citizen or community scientists to catalog fungal diversity all around North America using iNaturalist um, so iNaturalist was that uh, app or website I mentioned before. It's a database for biodiversity, and it can be used by anyone, whether they're an expert or just sort of an interested person. Um, and you can document the biodiversity around you, and that can actually be really good data for scientists who are who have particular questions about that area. Um, so what it does is that instead of, you know, needing a single person or a team of experts to go everywhere in the world to look for fungi, we can take advantage of the fact that there are many people who want to help and who are outside all the time and they can just sort of take photos and, and, and contribute towards this project of documenting what's there. Because if we don't know what's there, we can't argue for its protection. Or we can, certainly we can argue, but we, it's not going to necessarily be something that the government will listen to. The government wants quantifiable data, um, which is another, that's a whole other maybe discussion. So that's, I think, maybe a start at answering your question. Yeah, although I'm just thinking, um, and we can have, you know, we don't have time to go into it in depth right now, but it makes me realize that we probably need to, as a land trust, be monitoring and evaluating what what the fungal diversity is on our own properties, comparing that to, um, you know, especially in the pristine old growth forest, what does mm -hmm. it look like there versus second growth forest versus highly disturbed land? Should exactly, we be yeah. managing for fungal diversity, either reintroducing certain fungal species, removing, if there is such a thing as an invasive fungal, which I'm guessing there probably is. Yes, um, we don't know too so much about it's just that, a whole... Yeah another layer of complexity. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And I feel yeah. like it's interesting. I think that as you're raising these issues, it makes me think about some of the parallels we're learning about lifetime around better understanding bacteria, the human biome, the presence mm -hmm. of face mites and things like that, that we're now understanding affects our our physiology, our psychology. Um, and so it feels like, um, and maybe this is too gross of a generalization, but like we are collectively starting to better understand that there are these small, smaller things in the world that matter tremendously. And just because we can't see them doesn't mean they don't determine the future of the planet. Absolutely. You know, yeah, just absolutely. as I was listening to you talk about fungus, I thought there's a lot of parallels there. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I love thinking about the fact that we have more fungal and bacterial cells in our body than we have like human cells, right? So I like to joke that we're like a bunch of microbes in a trench coat, you know, just I'm trying to make sense of the world. Yeah. And But we, but what sort of like, I think is a really profound point is there's this idea called the hollow genome concept, which is sort of asking the question like, what is the relevance of an isolated genome? If you were to so totally separate like a, a being's genetic information from sort of the ecological context in which it evolved, is that being like understandable? Is it legible? Is it, would you be able to recognize it? And, and sort of the, the argument is that no, like the DNA is, um, you know, embedded in these really complex webs. You're, human, whether you're a human or you're a bacteria or you're a fungus, all of these ways of being are mutually mutually dependent. And not only in this intellectual way, but in a very, very material way, like our actual processes in our bodies would not function if it were not for these other microbes that live within us and that we, and, or, and all around us. Um, and our DNA is this sort of mix, like messy picture of this long history of these encounters. Um, and, and I think that that is, this is a powerful idea. I mean, to maybe to some people, I'm sure it's obvious, right? But on the other hand, it, it's like coming as a surprise to a lot of scientists because 
even though I think, again, intellectually scientists will, will say like, oh, of course, like we're not, you know, we believe in evolution, evolution's not end or, you know, there's no end goal. But the way people still talk about it is still sort of with surprise that we are so dependent on everything else. Um, so I, what I, I think is so powerful about this idea is that it can lead you to forming really sensitive and more complex and then therefore more meaningful relationships with other species. And I think this is important both for your own well-being as a, as a person who, you know, can be, you know, being in nature and, and increasing your number of species encounters, whether you live in the city or in like a rural place, you know, increasing your attention and your awareness of other species makes you feel better. You It lowers your blood pressure. It makes you feel happier. And also you become more in tune to the ways in which the world like needs your support and that other organisms need your support. So it, it kind of, the this uh, awareness is, is it does a lot of things, right? It, it can help you form um, meaning, I think, in, in life. And in, 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 like, even if you're not a scientist, it can help you, it can help you understand and be motivated towards conservation goals and for the protection of other species as well. Yeah, you know, I've been spending a lot of time recently with indigenous uh, people in our region. And what I found, and this is a gross generalization, so forgive me, but um, what tends to be consistent across different tribes is this very clear awareness of uh, the connectivity between all different forms of life and this um, non-hierarchical uh, sense of humans as above it all and controlling it all, but rather part of it all and interconnected. Um, and it leads to an approach of compassion and a sense of connection mm -hmm. to other species. I'd be curious to know whether indigenous cultures thought about fungus. They probably did because sure, they probably sure. were aware of, um, but anyway, uh, it's just to say that I think, um, I think it's a, the disconnect that you see in our, in the dominant mainstream culture in this country right now fosters that disconnect and lack of compassion, both between humans and the rest of nature, the rest of the natural world, fungi or not, and, and between humans, which I think is the larger point of your, of your thesis. So right, maybe right. pivoting to the eugenics issue, this is a super sensitive topic for a lot of conservationists and especially for an organization as old as ours. Um, that is founded on redwood conservation was one of the mm -hmm. first um, in the nation organizations focused on conservation and chose this iconic species, you know, buying into this idea that there are species that are more pure, more important, more dominant. Um, and many of the founders of the conservation efforts in the redwood world were eugenicists, as you noted. Mm -hmm. and Semper Virens has gone back and looked at some of our founders to see whether those thoughts were prevalent. And we don't find documentation of it, but it's hard to believe that it wasn't there, given that that was the culture of the day. Mm -hmm. So uh, I feel like in some ways we're inadvertently perpetrating this idea, certainly in a natural context, by glorifying redwood trees, we are implicitly um, glorifying those species over others. But in any case, I, I'm curious to know whether you think um, there are things that can be done now to help raise awareness about this uh, and learn the lessons. Um, and I think most importantly, eugenics at the time was considered the science of the day. We mm -hmm. are, as a conservation organization, pride ourselves as following the science of the day. And yet we can see that it led us societally down a certain path. It led to all kinds of things, the, the decimation of indigenous peoples in this country, the Holocaust in Europe. You know, there's so many horrible examples. And it also um, has resulted, if you look at the perils, parallels in the natural world, to a prioritization of sort of sexy species and not of all species. So mm -hmm. curious how we should be thinking about it today and for an organization like mine, how we, how we can learn from those lessons. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways to go from there, I think. But when I'll start by saying that my intention is not at all to say that if you love and are in awe by, you know, redwood forest, that you're, you're a eugenicist or something like that. Right. I've, right. you know, and, and I don't, I don't think, I hope that no one thought that, but I would just want to make very clear that you can love redwood trees. And that's not, not trying to, you're not canceled. Um, but I think what we need to do is there's a lot of, I think this is a very multi-pronged like response that's needed, right? So I think, you know, your organization um, is doing wonderful things to conserve the land and cooperate with indigenous peoples from your this region. And I think that that is um, part of it, right? We need like, so there's the, there's social elements that need to be um, addressed and, and basically knowing, you know, knowing the land that you're on, knowing who came before you, and knowing the history that shaped that land is, is something that everyone should should learn. Yeah. Um, and then figure out how you can best ally yourself to the needs of the people who came before you, right? So um, knowing what, what, what are their goals right now? How can you support them? What are your skill sets that you have as a person that can be lent towards that? Um, which, you know, there's different movements and different needs at different times, depending on where you are in the world. So it's hard to speak in a total generalization. Um, but knowing also that I think really committing yourself to um, this a, a new kind of breadth of conservation, which is one that is trying to center a diversity of life forms that it, or have historically been excluded from conservation networks and and projects. So like like considering you know actively funding the research of mycology, so or or hosting mycologists or consulting with mycologists and um and, and, and trying to best advocate for the land in all of its complexity. Um, and I think people, I kind of was uh, talking about this before, but as an individual, things that you can do or get involved with um I think becoming, you know, the, the climate crisis and all of this stuff is so complex and so overwhelming um, that it can feel like you don't even know where to start. But one thing that I teach to my students um, and I've drawn a lot of inspiration from myself is being just a steward of your backyard, right? The the scale of, of the planet is just absolutely, like you cannot even comprehend it, never mind really affect change on that scale. But what you can do is be a person who knows thoroughly and deeply about the, the beings that you share your day with and your, your immediate vicinity with and noticing them, watching them, being a naturalist, right? Um, that can actually be materially helpful to scientists who are trying to protect those organisms. If you are reporting data about particular birds or particular fungi, you know, over the course of 10 years that you've lived in a particular home, all of that information can actually be like really powerful, especially done collectively. And then there's also this other element to it, which is that the benefit it brings you, which is, you know, um, I'm not saying that that should be the, the, so the first reason to do it, but I think that it's undeniable that you will, like when you're in community, you feel better and you, and there, and it brings you purpose and it brings you into, I think, um, a more sensitive um, mindset and it, it actually makes you a better steward of the land um, when, you, when the more you notice the more you notice and then you know become a kind of it changes you I think um, so I, there's getting involved with projects like the fungal diversity survey or you know your local uh, mycological societies um, a lot there's mycological societies all over the country and they offer way you know workshops and ways of learning about mushrooms and also projects for recording species over time um you know I mean these are just this is sort of just a scattershot of of things that you can do I mean there's much more that you know I don't know I'm I'm just this is kind of a mix of different elements of responding to the questions that you posed um but yeah, I think that, I, well, let me pause there, maybe see if you want to respond to that. Well, I think, um, yes, yes to what you've said. And I think it's a good reminder that uh, science is ever evolving and mm -hmm. science oh, that is part. always yeah, yeah. right. And um, the same science that led us to prioritize uh, white people over other peoples or that led us to prioritize redwoods over fungi 
is something we should continue to question and examine and um, interrogate as we go and do yeah. our conservation work. And conservation is uh, filled with stories of people getting the science wrong <laughs> because nature is way more complex than we realize. It mm -hmm. will continue to be that way. And so it suggests there's a certain humility and a certain compassion that we need to um, bring into our work. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the point that you're raising about like the science of the time is such an important piece of this because again, I am a scientist and I, I think science is such a powerful tool. Um, and I, you know, you know, I'm I'm very sensitive to ways in which people are ha you know, will attack science with very bad faith arguments, right? Trying to sow discord and cause harm by undermining, you know, scientists who are generally genuinely trying to help people or help the world. Um, of course, I'm very sensitive to that, but at the same time, like science does need critique. It does need self-reflection and it needs to be examined by within from scientists, but also from concerned parties, right? People need to have um, input into how science is playing out, right? It doesn't exist in this vacuum. And the legacy of eugenics is a really dark stain on the, on, on the history of science and one that a lot of scientists would very much like to bury and just forget yeah. about and not be held accountable for. But if we're not, if we don't go through the pro this process of accountability and reflecting on how did this happen, how was science used for evil, then it's bound to repeat itself. Um, so I think there's this really sensitive thing going on where you need as a scientist to be humble, to be self-reflective, but also like know how to navigate bad faith arguments which are really common in this like very polarized political situation that we're in right now so it's it is a delicate dance but i think this this like kind of just regurgitating like always follow the science is is that can meaningless be, that's not, yeah that's not it's that's not really the the solution and it's actually yeah. a little frightening when when if you think about the history right um, and again, like it, it can't really be overstated how prevalent eugenics is and what was, but has still kind of remained. It's again, yeah, it's well, the spillover effects have been enduring. And yes, exactly. I think also it's similar with the conservation movement. It wasn't just eugenics, but, you know, I said this at my very opening early sentences of this webinar that there were indigenous people in this area who were forcibly displaced. And that's how we then had quote unquote empty land that we, Semper Virens and others could conserve. We didn't do the mm -hmm. actual displacement, but we certainly benefited from it right. indirectly or, mm -hmm. you know, unintentionally. But, um, and I think the best we can do now is to try to be transparent about it and to try to right. think about whether we're doing that again in a modern day form in some other ways that we're not aware of and to tr just try to be um, more cognizant. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it, it, it's great to, I mean, it's just a, it's a really important project that you guys are undertaking with that. Um, and yeah, so I, I definitely, I, I would love, you know, that all, more of these conversations could happen in conservation spaces, which, you know, has this history of being very white and very um, upper class um, and uh, exclusionary, frankly. Um, so I would love to see this continue to, to percolate and, and be addressed in, um, in, in other organizations as well. Yeah. Well, so I have horribly mismanaged our time. <laughs> um, I want to turn to my colleague, Matt Schaefer, to see, Matt, if you feel like we can squeeze in a question or two and maybe go over a little bit, or if you think we should instead promise our audience that we will try to take some of these questions offline and share them with people via email. Um, I'm going to uh, request that we do a little bit of both, if possible, okay. um, because there, there were a great many questions, but one I'm sure. <laughs> follows on what you were just talking about, and uh, I thought it was probably worth maybe stopping there and um, uh, and and taking the rest offline. Um, really interesting question about the accumulation of scientific wealth built on the unrecognized labor of others, and I was wondering if you might speak a little bit more, Patty, about how to participate ethically in systems of science? Um, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. You know, so, so much knowledge um, 
has come, you know, so scientists have this, we like to uh, invoke a line that was spoken by Isaac Newton, like, which was something to the effect to paraphrase, like, if I have seen at all, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, right? So scientists like to say this because any decent scientist would understand that nothing you achieve in your career is really done truly just because of you. Um, you've, you know, you've benefited from the, the toilings of countless people who came before you and, and laid whatever groundwork for whatever field you're in. But I still think that scientists are not, we still haven't had a full reckoning with, so while some people are, you know, maybe sci some scientists are very reflective about that. And then others seem to, um, you know, still manage to, to not comprehend how many people's voices were erased um, and how much knowledge was just destroyed or lost or appropriated um, because of the way scientists, like science is institutionalized. Um, and I do like to differentiate between science as like a method and a project versus like the, the institutionalization of science. Those are those are very different different things. Like as a anyone can deploy the scientific method, regardless of your your like institutional affiliation or your age or your gender or race. Um, but of course, who gets to have jobs in science? Who gets to make de powerful decisions about funding and all of these things? Are those are institutional um, like phenomena that then play out, of course, through cultural, uh, like, you know, a kaleidoscope of cultural impact. Um, but so historically, of course, women were prohibited from science, um, or people were excluded based on race and class, and but yet their knowledge would somehow often sometimes just be kind of sort of absorbed or taken credit for. Um, and I think one thing that happens a lot today, actually, is that when people study biodiversity around the world, often they are people from North America who have a lot of funding or institutional support, and they can go to the global south um, and conduct research there and then, you know, sort of rely on the local knowledge of people who are, you know, naturalists and really well, um, you know, who deeply know their landscape, and then sort of export those findings back to the institution in North America, public Publish it, you know, are making salaries based off this work, getting grant money based on it. And, and you know, there's starting to be a push towards, you know, appropriately recognizing the local people who facilitated that work. But, you know, that conversation is like just starting to happen, which is really egregious. I mean, I, you know, for so it means hundreds of years of this have been going on. Um, and only now is it like becoming a, a, an, an emphasis that you should like appropriately cite the labor of people from the global south. So, you know, there there's I mean this problem is enormous and sprawling. I can't summarize it even, but it's a it's a big it's a big problem. Um and I I hope that, you know, we scientists need to continue to be reflective about it and be receptive to criticism and account and pushes for accountability. Sarah, I think with their time you might want to go ahead and and Okay end this, but uh, we will follow up with everybody with links from today and talk with Patty Moore offline on about some of your other great, great Yes, questions. we will get back with as many answers as we can to your question, to the questions that have been raised. Um, clearly, we needed a longer session with you. <laughs> so thank you, um, Patty. I really appreciate it. There's so much here to think about. Um, and to our audience, thank for, thanks for sticking with us and sticking over time for a little bit. Um, please join us next month on March 28th when we will actually be hosting our very own colleague, um, uh, our Director of Land Conservation, Laura McClendon, and we'll be talking about Sempervirens Climate Action Plan and how we are uh, modifying our work to make sure we're effectively addressing climate change. But within that, we're going to have to make sure we we um, add a component around around what we're going to do about fungus in our region because it's not been something we've thought deeply about up until now. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for raising these issues with us. And again, thanks yeah. to our audience. And we'll see you next month. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for everyone who attended and asked such thoughtful questions. I really appreciate the time with you all. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.